Welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Anthony St. George. I'm the Director of Development for Citrus. Thank you for coming out to our talk today. Um, I want to thank also our sponsor, Infineon, for sponsoring the lunch and this broadcast. And I want to say hello to our three other Citrus campuses who are joined by uh, the web. Um, today we have a very exciting talk, um, but before that, just a few uh, announcements. On March 16th, we have Susan Landry from UT speaking on education and technology. And also at the back, there are flyers on the Big Ideas competition, the 30K uh, competition, that's due, and the proposals are due on March 23rd. Um, so today we're very happy to welcome John Lamonchek, the president and CEO of Cybeam. Um, Cybeam is a company that designs very high-speed circuits um, at lo ultra low cost to uh, get it into consumer products. That's the goal. Um, John himself is a, uh, an executive who hails originally from Silicon Image, where he was vice president of the company's consumer electronics and PC display business. Uh, in the past, uh, John was also directed the Lego Company's West Coast Design Center, which was focused on high-tech toys. Um, including the successful Mindstorms uh, product line, which you may be familiar with if you have kids. Uh, and um, Lam uh, John was also attended UC San Diego and spent several years uh, researching VLSI for imaging and pattern recognition applications uh, during his graduate studies at Caltech. So without further ado, John, please take it away. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Um, you know, I like to have a very interactive talk, uh, and so please feel free to ask questions, uh, you know, and get my attention during it uh, as we go along. I'll also say, um, you know, thank you for inviting me up here. Uh, the, the birth of Psybeam, as I'll talk a little bit about, came in large part out of a lot of stuff that happened here at Berkeley, so it's always fun to come back uh, up here and, and talk about this. It's also the first time I've given this particular talk, so another reason for it to be interactive. I, I always like to learn about any topic and hear your guys' opinions too. So please um, feel free to do this. So today's title, Technology Transfer, as uh, uh, um, Gary Baldwin, who's involved here at Citrus, asked me to come up here and talk about some of the challenges that it takes to move some of the technologies that you all are working on and, and innovating into a commercial reality. And um, so thinking about that in general uh, and also wanting to share what we did about that in Sidebeam really caused me to think about um, what we consider this technology transfer and some of the challenges are. So I want to talk about that um, and talk about, I think, some of, the, um, some of the industry pressure that is out there for any of you that want to go do this um, and some of the prejudices, almost, um, uh, that, that you'll have to overcome as you go along. So. Uh, let's get going. So, you know, the, the biggest problem often in these things is uh, solutions in search of a problem, right? You, you are very much, when you're in the lab and thinking hard about your particular, often narrow field, um, you have, you've discovered something or come up with something that um, is very innovative. Um, and you, it's basically, it is the answer. Um, but you have to find out what problem now needs to be solved with this new piece of technology. Um, and there are many examples, uh, and I, I talk about a couple here, of areas that were specifically focused on solution ideation. Right? I, mean, I think the, the one we talk about a lot here in Silicon Valley, uh, Xerox Park, right? this is a place revered for its research. Um, you know, and, and you can make lots of arguments about uh, Macintosh coming out of this, but certainly you know, Xerox isn't building Macs, right? Apple is. So they, they had tremendous ideas, none of which were personally um, commercially viable to that company, um, and despite the fact that that was their mandate. Um, another real um, almost boondoggle, uh, a lot of people would say, uh, interval research. So Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, put hundred million dollars into this research institute with the idea to recreate the Xerox PARC environment, but this time do it right. This time get some of that technology transferred out into real companies. Uh, they had a very innovative model where they would grow a lot of ideas, spin them out into small startups so that they weren't trying to do it just as part of Interval, but that was the incubator and, and do some of those. Um, um, I was actually part of some of that. That's how I got involved with the Lego Mindstorms group. Uh, but um, again, 
the, the attitude there, because it was so focused on ideation, um, there's a, a fantastic quote uh, from an article in Wired many years ago called Think Tanked, uh, where uh, a lot of the people were interviewed that were part of Interval just saying, hey, we just do cool stuff. Uh, and in fact, I even had a good friend of mine who had gone through several startups at that point, was a little burned out, and he went to work up there because he called it the retired entrepreneur's home. Right, this is a place where uh, you know, the pressure of getting to market, the pressure of satisfying customers, the pressure of getting uh, this, this competitive environment and winning was removed because there was this huge amount of funding. You didn't even have to compete for grant money. Right? Here was this $100 million pot you could go dip into and be smart for a while. Uh, and that model uh, really didn't do anything for about seven years. Uh, Paul finally brought in some new management. He had bought Charter Communications, and he wanted to try and move some of this technology out into his high bandwidth products. But again, uh, very, very little of that succeeded. Um, and as I mentioned, in terms of the, the community out there that, uh, that is, has some investment dollars, uh, uh, decreasingly so, unfortunately, these days. But the folks that have these dollars to go help this technology transfer, science is a bad word to these people, right? This is a science project, is an absolute epithet in the venture community. Um, and if, if you can't show why it isn't just science anymore, uh, you're not going to get funded. So, so that's the challenge of, of taking some of the just raw technology and turning it into something. And, um, but there's a similar problem on the other side, right? You can't just have, make up problems that don't really need solving. Um, my, you know, and some of you may be a little young to remember a good old sock puppet, um, but you know, this is a company back in the dot-com boom in the late 90s and 2000, it only lasted about two years, even though they actually went public, um, uh, who's, you know, said, oh great, here's the internet, we'll sell things over it, let's, we'll sell, mm, okay, pet supplies, right? Without considering that shipping a 50 pound bag of dog food is actually a tremendously difficult thing and it's probably easier for you to just pick it up at the store. And in fact, they even recognized this in themselves as they were struggling for a reason to be. They spent several million dollars in Super Bowl advertising with the tagline, you know, you should, do, you should use their service because pets don't drive, right? Um, and, and that's, you know, again, we're just trying to wedge the solution that was around um, that was a very good solution into a problem that actually didn't need to be solved, as opposed to Amazon.com, who had a, exactly the same business model, but with the critical difference that you could not possibly physically walk around or even go to a bookstore that had access to every single title Amazon could. Right? So they actually found a problem in the marketplace where the power of what, what internet was happening um, was, could be taken advantage of, and it just happened to be that they would then ship it to you. Right? The whole model of Pets.com was that they were shipping it to you, and that wasn't enough. There needed to be some other piece of this problem that they were solving. So I think it's important to remember um, kind of these lessons um, about as you're taking your technology and looking for problems, make sure that it's actually a problem and you're not just applying your technology into a convenient place that you can see it will obvious, obviously fit. Um, uh, the, you know, the other thing, too, is that that, that aspect is, is, needs to be communicated. You know, what you're trying to do needs to be communicated to people. Um, and I think this is also something that gets lost a little bit on the technology side. Um, in doing some homework uh, for this talk, you know, and, and thinking about these two case studies, I'd never really looked at the Amazon.com logo very closely before. And if you see this little A to Z, that was their original tagline, right? Every product from A to Z, that's what they were going after. And it's subtle, but it very strongly communicates what their actual problem was that they were solving. You couldn't find everything from A to Z, every author from A to Z, if you just walked down to the bookstore. Um, and so, so I think it's, it's important to capitalize on that as you think about transferring this technology because what problem you're solving and how easily you can communicate to that people is critical in this kind of environment. Um, just as an aside, another one of my favorite logos, FedEx, uh, that many people, you know, it's like, okay, fine, it's FedEx, that, that many people just absolutely pass on is the fact that, you know, this is an arrow, right? Um, that is absolutely talking about speed, delivery, go through. It's, it's, 
basically subconscious. Most people don't even look at that arrow. I guarantee you now you'll never ever not see it again. Um, nevertheless, I've broken you all for the FedEx logo. Nevertheless, that was critically thought about, and this is a, another big case study in branding and, and a, um, a very interesting thing and something to think about as you're, as you're looking for problems to solve and the way to communicate that to people. Okay, so um, why do companies have research and development teams and not research teams? Right? There are a few, as I mentioned, Xerox, PARC, right? the, the R in, in PARC and, and interval research. It was just research, and those, as I had said before, really didn't produce a lot of things that were viable in the market. But companies have research and development teams, and, and there is a critical difference there is that you are, you know, you've got to have research, right? Um, companies and startups like ones I've been involved in the past depend on all of you to be thinking great thoughts, um, initially unfettered with a necessary big problem to solve, right? I mean, there's a, uh, there is a tremendous uh, desire in, in my business community to make sure that this pure science continues to happen. So we have to have these enabling technologies and ideas without focus, because otherwise you get, I think, too limited uh, within the structure of what you're living. It is the reason I continue to believe in the startup model, right? Um, and big companies um, are, are plowing along and they become a little ossified with the way they are doing things and despite being very innovative and continuing down their path, truly original things coming out of a big company is much more rare than some of the startup model can account for and I, and I truly believe it's part of this. But you've got to find the appropriate application, right? It's got to be taken out into the community in a way that makes a lot of sense. And um, a, a good friend of mine, Vijay Desai, uh, Vijay uh, was founder of a, a company that um, later merged uh, with several other companies and is essentially a, a chip that is the video processor in almost all of the televisions you own right now. He had a wonderful word for this, which, were, which is the way he identified problem solving, which were vitamins versus painkillers. So I, I borrow this from him all the time and try to give him credit wherever I do. But, you know... You'll spend money on vitamins, right? Everyone likes to feel like they're feeling a little better and solving a little bit more of their problem. Um, but you're not in dire need of a vitamin. If you get rushed in the morning and you zip out the door without taking your one a day, you know, okay, uh, you'll, you'll be fine and you might beat yourself up a little bit about it, but you'll just keep taking it the next day and that's okay. Uh, and you may find if you can't really tell how much it's doing for you, maybe when times get a little tough, you'll stop buying your vitamins. But if you're in pain, if there's something you can't do uh, that, is, that your pain is preventing you and you can get access to a painkiller, I guarantee you you're going to run out and go get that. Right? So there's a critical difference between problems that are um, incremental and solving a little better what you want to do versus something that can't be done another way. If you can get a hold of a problem that can't be done another way than with your technology, then that is really one of the critical hallmarks, in my mind at least, to uh, creating a successful startup. So, um, so what makes a good fit between these things and what, for those of you that are a little entrepreneurial minded with the kinds of things that you're doing, um, what makes a good fit for this point? Um, well, you have to have a tremendous advantage in price performance over what, you're, what, what else is going on, right? at least an order of magnitude. Um, in my world, I do semiconductor startups. If I don't have that 10x, Moore's Law is going to catch up with me by the time I can get out the door. Right? Big companies that can throw 200 people at a problem and $100 million without flinching and just ride the, the semiconductor doubling every 18 month curve down for all it's worth will catch up to something that is merely two or four times better. Right? Um, and it's going to take you longer than you think to get this out into the commercial uh, sphere. So you've got to have at least an order of magnitude per performance, price performance. And it's, so remember what I said, price performance, right? Because we're talking about a technology transfer into a shelf, into the consumer, even if it's doing the same thing, if it's 10 times cheaper, that's absolutely um, a, a winning combination as well. Um, a, it must represent a tremendous market return at least 20x, right? And everybody talks about 10x returns for the, for the superstars of people's portfolio. But when you're starting something, 
you always underestimate your costs, and your VCs have already multiplied what you've told them by a factor of two in terms of how much money you think to, you have to raise. I guarantee it. So, um, you know, so a, a 10x return, and uh, I was chatting earlier with a, a gentleman about uh, return models, right? Why, why such a tremendous return, right? Um, and these guys count on many of their portfolio companies failing, and they also count on this long-term aspect. Again, in my world, in, in semiconductor space, um, the average return for, uh, um, or the average monetization time frame is about 70 to 75 months. Right? It's about six years um, before there's a monetization event, and it's about 70 to 80 million dollars in. Right? So if you, if you can't point to your company and, and, and this technology enabling a billion dollars worth of value, they'll stop looking at you. Now that's very different for very different segments, right? I mean, it's worth it putting hundreds of millions of dollars into a pharmaceutical startup because they might have a multi-billion dollar um, you know, next generation drug that will be everywhere. Um, it's, it may only be worth, you know, you, you may only need a hundred million dollar return on a software startup that takes five or ten million dollars and you and your friends can get going. So the, the dynamics are different, but the multiplier is the same. And uh, so that's the other thing that has to happen for this technology to successfully get transferred out into the market. Um, you have to deeply understand your customer dynamics. Um, I can't tell you the number of um, of, of pitches that I've sit in, I, I get asked to do um, due diligence with some of the venture community, um, and the number of pitches where great technology, terrific market, and please give us $15 million because we'll be in production in six months and start getting revenue without understanding that their, their customers will have to evaluate the technology for at least a year before they're even going to think about putting it on the shelf, right? So understanding the dynamics of the market you're going in, um, uh, you know, if that's and some of these can be very short. Some of these are, you know, many, many years, um, you know, automotive industry or pharmaceuticals and getting past some of the regulatory and so forth. So making sure you understand that customer um, and be very focused on their needs. And then luck and timing are undeniably a factor, right? You do have to have some luck. There's a great Chinese proverb I have up on my wall. It says, you know, uh, a, a studious man, and I'm paraphrasing, but a studious man uh, can be successful, but it takes a lucky man to be wealthy, right? I mean, you do have to get a little luck along the way. Um, so I want to talk about Psybeam as, um, as an example of the way we address some of these challenges, just to put this in reality, right? Um, uh, because this, uh, I mean, I've, this is probably my fifth startup now. Um, there, this was very typical of some of the challenges of taking a raw piece of technology um, and looking for good application, finding the right dynamics, and really getting this off to market. So I want to walk you through a little bit of that, um, and we can talk about some of the challenges along the way and, uh, and some of the things that we faced. Uh, and I'm happy to take your guys' questions afterwards. So, um, so the big breakthrough here, the big idea, uh, was here at Berkeley, uh, down in the Berkeley Wireless Research Center. Uh, Bob Roderson, who is a you know, luminary in the wireless field. He's, uh, um, you know, been around for many, many years. Um, he uh, was one of the founders of Atheros, uh, right, uh, and, uh, you know, knows a lot about getting a high-tech startup off the ground and taking that technology transfer from the lab and out onto the shelf. Um, he and a couple of his very bright students, and also uh, Gary Baldwin, who I'm sorry isn't here, um, from Citrus, who had done a lot of original work at, in uh, HP Labs around this field, uh, had gotten together with a new way to look at modeling CMOS and how to uh, get circuits um, to run very, very fast. Uh, for the non-electrical engineers in the, in the room, uh, you know, most people look at um, the kind of chip processing that is in all of our computer chips, the CMOS processing, is kind of tapping out um, in the 5 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz range, and you need to go to some other more exotic technology, uh, a 3.5 compound device like silicon germanium or gallium arsenide or, or uh, indium phosphide even, something that doesn't have the economies of scale and, the, and the, the drive to cost reduction that CMOS has. Those technologies often people look to to do much faster. In fact, a lot of the early radios, um, even back in... Um, uh, for Wi-Fi, uh, even today, are still done in silicon germanium. So 
But Bob's previous success in this technology transfer had been about getting CMOS circuits to wiggle very fast uh, in the, in the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz regime. So he said, well, great. Let's go for that order of magnitude. Let's go up into 60, 70, 100 gigahertz regime for CMOS. Let's see if we can get circuits that will wiggle that fast. So he got a couple of very bright students, uh, Chin Doan and, and Saurabh Amami, who are uh, two of Cybeam's founders, to start looking at this back in 2001 um, as how could you uh, create a modeling system uh, that, w that could address this problem so that you could do these ultra high speed circuits in the same manufacturing and inexpensive technology that all the chips are, are being done in your systems. So, um, so they did that. They, after many years of study, and as Bob would describe it, breaking, relearning uh, microwave and millimeter wave uh, theory from the get-go, since that wasn't his area of specialty, um, they designed some, um, some circuit models, some way of looking at the problem, um, and doing some design work in, um, in CMOS that could validate this claim that we could accurately take the, design these circuits in simulation and get good results even up to 100 gigahertz at a time. So, you know, so here's this wonderful core piece of technology, right? You can very accurately, right? So here's, here was simulation and measured data. Um, and this was done um, thanks to some grant money from ST Micro. And this was done back in the 0.13, right? 130 nanometer, where today's, you know, where they're talking about the next generation of, of Intel chips just about to come out at 32 nanometers. So this wasn't bleeding edge CMOS where things do get a little easier. This was, you know, kind of even at the time, um, the last generation of CMOS. This is many generations ago now, but the last generation of CMOS, so it was cheap. And so here's this wonderful core piece of competency that you've got. You can design circuits that are incredibly fast and they're really cheap, right? Well, everything wants to be fast and cheap, right? This sounds like this should be an easy problem uh, for technology transfer. But, um, you know, finding just the right niche and the dynamics of how you take that to market um, were pretty challenging for the team. So, anyway, so a lot of work done here at Berkeley. Um, uh, I just wrestled Chin and Saurabh to the ground and made them finish writing their thesis. So they are actually PhD graduates of Berkeley, finally, now uh, eight years later. Um, but because they got so enamored with this idea of transferring the technology out to the company, they started doing that before they, they finished up, which is a, a tremendous lure. I suffer from the same lore. I still don't have my doctorate from Caltech. Because uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, these problems are very different. They're very different challenges than when you're working on the bench than when you're trying to make a million of these things a week. The other problem to solve um, that, was, that these guys looked at was that radios were incredibly inefficient. Right? Uh, so Bob knew that, that with this uh, technology, uh, that certainly something was going to be done with the radio wave aspects of it. I mean, having these circuits just try and compute very fast weren't what they were after. They were after something that could do some form of communication, send this power through the air very efficiently, very low power. So the other problem they were looking at was you know, omnidirectional radios are pretty inefficient, right? Um, they're sending energy all over the place, hoping that one of those pieces of it will get from the transmitter to the receiver and make a connection. Uh, things are getting a little smarter now with these um, MIMO systems, these new 11N systems, where it's spraying around, but it's getting multiple bounces around the room to, to have many paths line up to help aggregate bandwidth. That's why we're getting a little bit more oomph out of the dot .11 folks. But um, the real way to do this would be to just point the energy that, of interest exactly where you wanted it to go, right? Create, much like a, you know, a flashlight or some form of mirror system, to create a, a, a much more concentrated beam of energy from the transmitter to the source um, and put all of that antenna gain exactly where you wanted it. Right? So that was the other piece of core enabling technology that these guys had worked on. So this could be used in a lot of places. Um, there are some nice bands reserved out there in the 26 gigahertz and in the 77 gigahertz area for automotive radar. Um, automotive radar, uh, there was just an article about Volvo implementing this uh, a couple of weeks ago in the San Jose Mercury News, but uh, adaptive cruise control, so staying right behind the car in front of you, or collision avoidance technologies where um, you, know, you don't want to back up over the kid behind you on his bike and you want to have a little alarm go off so that you don't do that. Um, there are many ways to do this, but radar is very effective because it doesn't worry about if it's getting dirty or if it's got snow on it or all the other things that can mess up some of the um, other ways to do this problem. 
Um, but there are other ways to do that problem. And furthermore, getting yourself designed into an automotive safety system, I don't know if there is a longer market than that. It's a tremendous market because it's, a, it's what's known in the industry as a very sticky socket. Right? If you win that design, you don't get plinked out of it very easily. So it's, um, it's, it's a nice market. It's actually one of the first things Bob and his team looked at to go address, but it is you know, four or five years design in cycle, and then maybe you're going to get the win, and your vendors have to go through all kinds of hoops with regulatory <coughs> and so forth. Very challenging market. So then there's some more obvious ones, right? Data transfer, OK? We've got, you know, we, we, there was um, uh, Bluetooth screening along at very near field kind of rates, um, at fairly low rates. Some increased rates in that would be nicer. Uh, UWB was coming along uh, at a few hundred megabits per second. But if you could do you know, another 10 times that, do gigabits of data transfer, that sounds very interesting. Um, but again, there was kind of an existing way to do that. And the UWB market was already fractured and having problems. So you know, that, was, that you know, we'd wait on networking, you know, doing LAN. Uh, the next generation of wireless LAN would be interesting. Uh, security and imaging. Uh, this was right around the time 9-11 uh, had just happened. So millimeter wave scanning systems that are now starting to be deployed in airports were interesting as well. Um, but, but those were very cost insensitive, right? Uh, you know, no, people wouldn't mind buying your gallium arsenide chip in those because they could do a $20,000 installation. So these all had that vitamin solution feeling to them, right? There were either existing things to do, or it was going to take a long time, or there were not as much uh, um, dollar dynamics in terms of pressure, the low cost pieces, because that's the thing we have to keep in mind. It wasn't just about speed, but it was about something that needed to be low cost. So if price wasn't an object, then that was also not going to be a, a really effective market for this. So the, the focus then for the company became this image, right? The image and the vision for the wireless living room. Um, you know, people have, are, are you know, starting to have real flat TVs. Um, you know, I think in the days when a plasma TV was 200 pounds and 5 inches thick, it's a little challenging to call that a flat TV. Most people still put that on a shelf. Um, or if they didn't, they would call a contractor in to find two studs in the wall and put a professional mount system in and hide the wires and, and all that. And it was a tremendously expensive experience. But now, TVs are getting to be legitimately flat and light. Uh, in fact, Sharp just released a television that is, it's gorgeous. It's a 50-inch TV. It's half an inch thick, and it weighs 25 kilo. Right? You can really take a couple of picture hooks and hang it on your wall. So now, if you're doing that yourself, getting data up to that thing without all these ugly cords hanging off of it um, is a real challenge. Um, and you know, power, certainly, you need to get there. But there's an awful lot of power around, my house at least. Um, and most people's house. So plugging the thing in conveniently or creating a little receptacle behind it is, is even something a not too expert handyman can pull off. Um, but running cable, running component wire, running even networking all to this thing is a real problem. So, so this had that hallmark of the painkiller, right? It, there was no other current way to do it. Um, and it was something that the market was now ready to want to ask for. Um, so, so that was the problem that Cybeam selected to focus on. Question. What about the uh, networking over uh, home uh, power wires? So I'll talk a little bit about that there um, and I, when I talk about some of the competing technologies to this. Um, but there are uh, very stringent um, uh, um, bandwidth limitations to that. They can only do a few hundred megabits per second. So, so the goal here was to, to get into, so this was a good market for us, right? Because it was cheap. Uh, it had to be very low cost. I mean, buying. You know, every year things come down 10, 15 percent. So we focused on this in-room media connectivity from some form of high-definition source device, you know, BD player, what have you, to the TV. But we wanted to do that um, with an uncompressed link. Um, and that, so an uncompressed link then for, for you know, 1,000 lines of video progressive at 60 frames per second, that is 3.5 to 4 gigabits per second of data through the air. So that spoke very nicely to the technology's ability to go very fast and to have to be cheap. So we have this multi-gigabit forward rate channel. Um, the reason, and to, to answer a little bit of your question about Powerline, the reason that, that we at least believe that that was necessary is that that TV is the, the end point in your, in your system. And um, there's an awful lot of, of uh, branding and things that happen in your set-top box, your, display your source device, your PS3, what have you. And so 
to rely on sending the original compressed content over your TV wasn't going to work. So you're going to have to decompress content at the source in order to overlay graphics for program guide, for menuing systems, those kinds of things, which means you're going to have to recompress it if you're going over an, a, a compressed length. Well, I will tell you that that single chip recompression, while possible, it is not Hollywood studio offline, many, many hours of, of compute kind of compression, where even the cinematographer is involved in picking the keyframes and so forth, right? So that is a very different flavor and level of artifacts and compression than an uncompressed link. Furthermore, um, those good compression techniques want to look at many frames of data to, because one of the ways a good compression techniques do is they look, they estimate motion so they can kind of fill in the blanks, right? So you've got to have multiple frames to see things moving, um, and that means that there's latency in the link. Uh, four or five frames of latency on the source, four or five latencies of fra of fr or frames of latency on the receiver. Pretty soon you're 150 milliseconds behind where your source device is. For anybody that's a Twitch gamer in here, you'll feel that, right? You'll crash into walls, your friends will kill you. And so, uh, so for, for watching a movie, latency, who cares, right? If I'm 10 seconds behind my movie, I, I, I can't tell. But if you can feel it in challenge, channel change, or if you can feel it in a, in a Twitch game, then it's unacceptable to this particular market. Um, I, I should say one more thing about that. We learned that lesson. Oh, yeah, go ahead. You could, but when then, so now that becomes an interesting process. That's a great technical answer, right? But now let's look at the market dynamics. Who is sending content into your house? Unless you have an antenna on your roof, which most people in the United States don't. There's a content provider in there, an, uh, what's called MSO, Media Service Operator. And so part of the dynamics of this market is the way they <laughs> hang on to you is by upselling you, uh, or the way they make money from you, it's called ARPU, right, the revenue per user. Um, is by upselling you services, pay-per-views, and so forth. And that look and feel, how easy it is to use your DVR, and the menuing system, all that, that's their look and feel. If they suddenly relied on the television to take some of those commands and put it up on that, your experience is going to be very Sony-esque if you have a Sony TV. It's going to be very Sharp-esque if it's a Sharp TV. You'll still have the underlying controls, but you'll be married to your Sony brand not to your Comcast brand. And so swapping that out for DirecTV, you will do in a second, because your TV experience won't change. So the MSOs don't want to do that. And so there's a tremendous market pressure to not do that solution, even though I agree it uses less bandwidth and can preserve the original content. You could, but then, but then there's no reason for the TV guy to do that because then he doesn't get his brand in front of your face, right? So, so, so the, so we tried this, right? So my, uh, as was mentioned in my bio, so I was head. I actually created the Sil Consumer Electronics Group at Silicon Image and brought HDMI to market. So this year there'll be a billion ports of HDMI in various devices around the world. Our big competition at that time was 1394, which had a nice footprint in consumer electronics. Uh, every camcorder in the world at that point, this is 2001, 2002, had a 1394 connector on it. Apple, Firewire, pushing it very hard as their media interface. Uh, TVs were starting to have them on it. The problem that happened was, one, this branding issue, and two, the con consumer confusion over codecs. Because right? your TV spoke MPEG-2, and your camcorder spoke DV. Right? They were not encoded the same way. And even though they had exactly the same physical connector and the same phi and the same electronics, hook those two things together and they don't really work very well. That you can control each other. Trying to get a guy in a blue shirt at Best Buy to explain that to a consumer, they're just going to give it back and ask for one that doesn't have that feature on it that's 100 bucks cheaper. So, um, so HDMI exploited that opportunity, even though there was this big footprint, which is, hey, here's just the digital version of your component video. Right? So the same argument here. There are lower bandwidth ways to do this with complex compression codecs and so forth that will evolve over time. But you buy a cheap one of these a lot more often than you buy an expensive one of those. And so, so having that be the, the absolute 
base video, you know, just pixel data, is the most future-proof thing you can do for your TV. Um, so, so, so anyway, so a lot of dynamics there, but excellent questions. Um, so, so we want to do this, um, but we also want to do more than just the cable replacement, right? We have this back channel. It's low rate back channel is part of the technology. Low rate when you're doing gigabits of data is, uh, you know, tens, many tens of megabits still, 50 megabits. So that's on the order of today's dot eleven networks. So what we can do is bring this television into this whole network of devices, right? Besides feeding the big fat pipe to the display, these devices can be sharing content. They can be moving um, music around. They can be moving compressed files in their original state from, say, your iPhone to your DVR and so forth. Um, and the, the, uh, because the technology is in CMOS and is low power as well as low cost, we can scale these things into small portable devices so that you, when you walk into the room with your PSP, suddenly you're playing it on the big screen instead of the little one that was on your handheld, right? So it can really create this whole experience around all the content that's swirling around your life in a way that, that other technologies can't. And this is a massive market, right? There's 300 million things with an HDMI connector on them being sold this year. Um, uh, and, and that represents about a $7 billion TAM, right? So you don't have to get very much of that TAM uh, uh, total available market, right? That's how much dollars there are to be had if, for instance, a wireless chip was in all 300 million of those things. So you don't have to be very much penetrated into that to have a tremendous business, right? So it, so it kind of met the metrics, right? It was, uh, it, it was the painkiller. Um, it, was, it was cheap. Uh, it needed to be cheap, and we were cheap. It needed to be fast, and we were fast. And it was a huge market, so venture guys could, could see very good return on this. And so, so you know, and, and really it was, had that fundamental order of magnitude thing going for it, right? Which is all these, even new technologies, UWB, which is, is um, really unfortunately not looking like it's going to happen, um, and dot .11, they were all trapped down here at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. So just kind of fundamentally, you could explain it pretty easily as an order of magnitude better because it was just 10 times faster of raw carrier signal, right? So, so being able to easily explain your technology is another really important hallmark to transferring it out into the market. Uh, being able to, to get people excited about this. Um, you know, and when I tell the Sidebeam story, oftentimes, you know, like the guy that's shooting the video will come to me and say, wow, when can I have one of these, right? If you, my test is if you can explain it to your mom, then it really is a good technology. And, we worry a lot about, we're down in my neck of the woods in Silicon Valley, we worry about the 650 area code syndrome, right, where we all get it because we're early adopters and, and folks that, um, that want to embrace technology. But you've got to make sure that folks in Poughkeepsie want to buy this thing too. All right, so, um, so, so modeling, and remember, so this, this whole Michigas came from just this core competency of being able to model CMOS, right? We, company wasn't comms guys. They weren't really uh, consumer electronics guys. Um, the, the, this core competency of the company uh, has been and is still today the fact that we are a CMOS modeling company. And that's a tremendous advantage in today's startup world because the, the foundry world that we live in where we all make designs and ship them off to other places to be manufactured, we really separate ourselves from the, the business of making chips, which means those people give us the models of how to build chips. If we, we don't rely on that back transfer, right? We create our own models, and it's actually a, it's a, it's a difficult step for us to take that model, those modeling structures, fab them, get them back, extract them. There's a lot of work involved before we can even start design that other startups don't suffer. But as a result of that core competency, we have a tremendous long-term strategic advantage. You know, nicely patented. Um, a lot of the, the research that came out of Berkeley is included in Cybeam now as well as some of the original guys. So, so let me, um, just to give you guys a little bit better kind of picture of the way this technology works, because this beam forming is a, is a big issue as well. We put together this little video of, of how the system works. So basically, if you're sitting in your living room, um, you know, enjoying some content with this TV on the wall, you, uh, you know, that'll come from a variety of sources. Maybe you've got a game box, um, you may have a, a set-top box or a, or a BD player. You may have downloaded some content on, off the internet onto your laptop, and uh, you want to get that access to the big screen or a camera or a little game. Anyway, all these devices scattered around the room would like access to that big screen that's on the, uh, you know, up on the wall. And furthermore, you'd like to control all that with a single simple IR remote. Right? 
So, so the way the system works is it works like a normal radio. It's kind of omnidirectionally at first. It attaches all these different devices to the network. That's one of the other big pieces that we worked on very hard is that nobody had to type in you know, SSIDs and do all this stuff. This automatically hooks up because you want to have a very lean back experience when you're doing this. And then we form this very tight pencil beam of energy between the source device and the receiver. And that's transmitting away at 3.5 gigabits per second, uh, enough to do full up HD content. And that's all well and good uh, until you block it. right? So if you, say for instance, get up and you need to go get something from the kitchen and block it, what we do is we can electronically steer this beam around by changing the, the phases of our various elements and bounce off the wall, bounce off the ceiling, basically take advantage of the same multipath environment that a MIMO system would, but just one path at a time, and continue that video uninterrupted. Now, furthermore, the back channel's running all the time. So if you should walk into the room with a little portable device that has this stuff in it as well, it'll automatically get added to this, this video area network, we call it. And depending on how the GUI of the television is written, um, it, you know, it may tell you, hey, I found a new device as part of the network. Would you like to get access to it? And you can go ahead and select that new device with your remote, because all of those things are being controlled over that radio link. And now the tight beam of energy is being formed from that device to the screen. So you can see the video you just shot without any wires. The, the beam steering technology is still running. So if you block that, or even if you move it around, it will continue to track you. Because we do that whole operation in less than 200 microseconds. So it's very, very low latency. It doesn't suffer from any of the latency problems I was talking about with compression. And so to the user, it's this omnidirectional radio experience, even though it's this very tight beam of energy. Uh, so you can see from, a, from a, 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 a set of scientists whose core competency was high-speed CMOS right, to this, I mean, that's, there's a many, many steps of technology along the way to get that core piece of science out into play in the market with all the rest of it. And, and uh, a lot of different engineering disciplines and so forth had to come to bear to solve some of those problems. Anyway, so that's just a little overview of how, how the system works. So, um, so we've got this, this market that we want to go after, um, and that's all well and good. And we've got the technology, just the raw technology transferred into something that we believe can be marketable. But now what, right? We've got our 10x performance. We've got this huge market potential, right? Even just 10% penetration into 40 inch and above TVs. You know, it's a wonderful market, right? There's 100 plus million TVs sold a year. Uh, it's one of the, um, I won't call it quite recession proof, but it is one of the places in the market right now where, um, where it's, it's, it's much more resilient than the rest of consumer electronics um, to these kinds of times. Because people stop going out to dinner and they stop going on expensive vacations, but they still want to feel comfortable at home, right? So this nesting phenomenon, uh, television sales are actually up 1% year over year in the fourth quarter of, of 2008. Um, and uh, they're, they're being slashed like crazy price-wise. But it is one of the things that is not getting uh, so affected by the recession. So in a, in a normal stock market, if you had $250 million in revenue, you certainly should be around a billion dollar company. So you know, even if it took us $100 million to get this done, there's a good return for the investors. Uh, talked about being a painkiller. We had a great experienced CE team. Um, and all that's great, and we have product, we've got shifts, but how do we get this out into the market? Right? Um, we believe it's a great technology and will solve the world's ills for all these cables hanging all over the place, even if all it did was make it so that you didn't have to crawl behind your cabinet when you brought home a new source device. That would be sufficient for me. Um, but but it's, there's this chicken and egg problem in communications, right? Uh, and that's one of the other things that I think, even when you have a technology that is all the way to the product point, people sometimes forget about it at the last minute, which is because we're a comms company, we need listeners and talkers simultaneously. And I am envious of people like cable companies that can control both ends of that link, or even cell phone people who can just say, OK, it's going to be CDMA, because uh, we make the towers, and we make the handsets, and off we go. But in our little world, you don't buy sources and sinks from the same people, right? You buy PlayStations and Xboxes, and Comcast comes in and gives you a set-top box for free. Uh, but then you go out and you buy a Sony TV or a Samsung TV, Panasonic TV, or you've got a little Pioneer or Denon or some high-end AV receiver that you'd like to be make, make part of this. So it's, you, know, you don't really have this luxury. And uh, the other thing that was preventing us was exactly the points you were making, right? Dot 11 exists. Compression exists. 
And from far enough away, maybe I won't see some of those image artifacts. And maybe I'm not a gamer, so I don't care. Right? So, uh, so we needed to do something about delaying those guys before we were really ready to go to market while simul hopefully simultaneously solving this chicken and egg problem. Right? So, um, so we adopted a standard strategy. And a standard strategy um, can have some challenges. Right? It opens the door to competition because you're teaching people what to do. Um, you, you, but you've got to, so you, in order to do this successfully, you've got to have some long-term advantage. So think about our technology, right? The technology that we're trying to get into the market is high-speed CMOS design. There's nothing in the standard that tells you how to do high-speed CMOS chips. It's all about this packet here and that packet there and wiggle this at the same time at this frequency. So we felt like we could sustain a standard strategy because we had the sustainable advantage in the cheapness of our solution. And uh, we needed to kind of sell the market before we had something to sell. So we could go run around and get everybody excited about this standard. It would make them think twice about some of the solutions you mentioned because they could see this coming um, and, and be participants in it. Um, so I've talked a little bit about this as a result of your question. But just as an aside, I mean, these, these other lossy compression techniques, you really can see them. And that was one of the things that, for instance, Best Buy told us. He said, if we could plug in an HDMI cable and we can have your wireless solution, if we can see the difference at all, forget it. Because a lot of these TVs live and die by the um, reviewers. And the reviewers are going to put up static test images and be incredibly discerning. And if you get a bad review, your TV's not going to sell. So, so certainly that was a big deal. But standards landscape are fraught with problems, right? IEEE is a, tr for any of you who have ever been to an IEEE meeting, it is an incredibly political dynamic. And it's a very strange dynamic because it's one person, one vote. Which sounds amazingly egalitarian until you think about a startup trying to do that. We could send my whole company to a dry triple E meeting and Motorola would outvote us, right? Because they just, oh, fine, we'll send 150 people. So there, ha, huh, right? So it's, it's very challenging for little companies to get things done and big guys just duke it out in there and it takes forever. Ergo is a classic example of the guys that basically invented 11N and are no more because that's, they realized they had to go into 802.11 to get their stuff into market, and they just got chewed up, and eventually Qualcomm bought them for a quarter of the money that was invested in them. So, uh, so we knew going into the IEEE was probably a little scary, but we wanted to be part of that because 802 has a great brand in wireless. So what we did instead was we formed our own little club. We said, all right, you CE guys, the IT world has made its standards. Let's go make one ourselves. Um, so we formed this industry consortium, not an international standards body, but an industry consortium of some of the top guys and created the standard, industry standard called Wireless HD. And that was focused on making this uncompressed solution between all these devices with data and control and all the rest of it. And it was great because we could have our customers basically not buying the competition, getting excited about our technology, and telling us exactly what chip to build for them. Right? So, so, and knowing that we had this long-term core competency that even when Broadcom and Marvell and some of the other big semiconductor guys entered, we could sustain against them. So we did that successfully. Um, we started with the top CE guys, LG, Panasonic, NEC, Samsung, Sony, and Toshiba. We wanted to make sure the PC guys were aware of this. So we brought Intel in. Um, and then finally, we wanted to say, you know, look, this isn't Cybeam proprietary stuff masquerading as a standard. So we brought Broadcom along for the ride, too, inviting them to compete with us, uh, knowing that the, they're really big in cable set-top boxes. And since those cable guys give you those or charge you $5 a month, unless this technology was integrated into a Broadcom transmitter, we'd probably never get that part of the market. So it was a no-give. Right? We could give up that part of the market for our technology because somebody else could do it better and cheaper and would help us then sell chips and TVs. Um, so we announced the standard a couple of years ago. We've got the whole rest of the CE world at this point involved as adopters of the technology, and also the whole ecosystem of this, you know, test manufacturers like Agilent, Tektronix, all these guys making this happen. And, um, you know, we, we, but we, even then we asked ourselves, are we solving the right problem? Do people want to network their whole house, or do they want to just get rid of their cables? And overwhelmingly people said, you know, 75% said, let's just get rid of the cables, right? So that was a couple of years ago. Um, so then we got a little lucky. So my friend, Hiro Sakamoto, who I've known for many, many years, a uh, very smart guy, and he had been promoted to CEO of Panasonic. And he came to me um, in 2007. He said, you know, 
we're doing this, this great wireless HD, could you give me a demo because, and he was very nervous about this, he said, because I've been asked to give the opening keynote to the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, you know, 150,000 people, and he wanted this cool new piece of technology to talk about as the future of what Panasonic was going to be focused on. So we enabled him, we cobbled together a, 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 a demo with FPGAs and bailing wire and a little duct tape and, and got him this demo. It was very exciting. He had this big cutting the cord moment where he snipped through the cord with some garden shears, sparks flew, and, and he said, you know, your TV is free from wires. Uh, you can see the wireless HD branding. Um, it was several hundred feet wide. And, and so this is where we really got lucky. And this got all the rest of the CE world so excited about wireless HD that they just came running to the table and said, when can we do a demo with you two? Um, so in fact, a couple of months later, the CEO of Samsung, uh, was asked to do the same thing at what is essentially the Consumer Electronics Show in Europe. He was giving the opening keynote at IFA in Berlin. Uh, you can see the wireless HD logo up there. That was part of Samsung's seamless experience. So now things are starting to, to fall into place from a, from a luck standpoint. Um, we went into production uh, a couple of months ago. And then at CES now, um, at this CES, that Sakamoto-san was CES 2008. Here at CES 2009, there are multiple vendors with lots of different product SKUs and so forth. And the other small piece of luck that we got, because I still worry about that chicken and egg problem of transmitters and receivers, the other small piece of just market timing that happened to happen is those super thin panels. They're getting so thin not just because backlights and glass are getting thin, but because the guys have decided to rip all the electronics out into a separate little box, a tuner box. And that's where all the legacy connectors are. It's where all the video processing and decoding is. And then they need to get that up to the panel that hangs on the wall. So your TV actually consists now of two boxes if you go out and buy a new super slim TV. And so we got to sell a transmitter and receiver in each one of those because it's a perfect application for our technology because it has to be uncompressed. There's no processing left in the, t in the, the panel that is now your TV. Um, so, so we got lucky with that. Um, in fact, Panasonic then launched their, the centerpiece of their whole line this year in, in uh, April. And uh, you can see this little nodule down here, which is um, the, the receiver piece of this. and, uh, and we got to sell it to consumers too, so we started doing some branding around wireless HD and so forth. So, um, and, and I, I mentioned this, you know, this two-box architecture really being the, the other piece of this that helped us uh, quite a bit with uh, with what we wanted to do. Um, so, so that all of that machinery, right? All of that was because these guys in the lab figured out how to do high-speed CMOS, right? So you can see the the, the difficulty going from this technology transfer to these other things. And I'm very hopeful for the company to go now address some of those other vitamin problems, right? Now that we've got the painkiller one done, we certainly expand our market into some of these data rates and so forth and go after some of these other things, which are certainly nice markets. So, you know, just to sum up quickly, because I know we're just about out of time, um, you know, moving from, from lab to the shelf, um, you've got to have the right technology for the problem. But it is also very important to find a good problem to solve, right? And, and, and re be cognizant of the fact that your technology idea and breakthrough is probably, while you may found the company on that, uh, you know, it is, it is a, there are a tenth of the people at Psybeam are involved in millimeter wave design, right? It's all the machinery of everything else that needs to get this out to market that is incredibly important. And you've got to have this little sprinkling of opportunity, right? And be ready to grab it when, uh, when you're going. So thank you very much for your attention. It was a great talk, thank you. I, well, I have two questions. One of them is for portable stuff. You know, you're expecting to get 10 watts of antenna power out of those things, and uh, how do you go through walls? So, um, so as you'll notice, uh, the, I was very specific about in-room, right? So, so something, I believe, something will network your house. Um, whether that be Powerline, which I think is a good solution, or uh, Mocha, this multimedia over coax. Um, even, you know, dot .11 networks don't work very well uh, when you're in Europe or Korea, for instance, where the walls are all concrete. So something's going to network your whole house, wired or wireless. What we're about is going from that source device, that little client that was part of that network, up to the TV. Um, and so, so similarly, when you have your portable device, the assumption is that you're in the room with it. Just like, for instance, Bluetooth, right? The assumption is you're within 30 feet of this thing. Um, so, and the 10 watts you refer to is our effective transmit power. So we, because we have 36 elements, 
um, we have a tremendous amount of antenna gain. So our, you know, our freeze law is like it's, we're cubed in the number of antenna elements. So it's 36 cubed is our, is our gain there. So we can be very, very low power with an uh, of actual power the chip draws and still get up to these tremendous bandwidths. So uh, for the portable form factors, um, we make a lot of assumptions about how, how really non-line of sighty it needs to be. You know, if you're willing to set your phone down on the, on the coffee table right in front of the panel, um, that's probably an okay usage model. So rather than, you know, 10 or 20 meters, you know, maybe we live with five meters and so forth. So there are a lot of things you can do depending on different usage models. Um, and, and like I said, definitely in room. And that's fine. Each radio to its purpose. Uh, you know, I mean, my cell phone has five different radios in it, right, for various different pieces of, of what it's trying to do. So, uh, so, so we don't worry about the wall problem for right now. Other questions? What's the potential for making, say, a, um, a converter that you can plug into an HDMI thing to, to bootstrap the, uh, the adoption process? So um, one of the one of the products that got launched at CES was exactly that. It's a little box that on the transmit side has a number of HDMI ports, a number of component video ports. You basically set it on your little stack of stuff, and then a very simple receiver with one HDMI out to your TV. Um, so, uh, and I, one of the things I didn't really talk about was with, without a standard, that would have been kind of the market we've been limited, limited to, this virtual wire. If you think about what that's doing, so you've got HDMI to the transmitter, HDMI out of the receiver, power to plug both of those things in. You now have four cables replacing the one that you wanted to make wireless, right? So it kind of defeated the purpose. So that was the other thing that really drove us to the standard strategy is that the adapter markets are necessary, but hopefully they go away very quickly as the stuff gets integrated. So you told us uh, many your technology came from a university such as Berkeley. So the question is, how much you have paid back to the university so far? And uh, another question is, what do you believe appropriate form of paying back? Uh, so excellent question. So you know, each university has its different IP policy, right? And I, I, you know, the University of California is incredibly generous with its IP. Um, and I, and Sidebeam was a direct beneficiary of that because we could not have started if this technology had been out licensed the way somebody like Stanford, for instance, or some of the more private universities do, where they actually have a, uh, they're trying to get a monetary stake in this, or, you know, or, we, or we'd have to give up another piece of the, of the company. So part of the reason I come here to do things like this is because of the, uh, you know, the, the debt, if you will, that I believe Sidebeam owes to the university environment. Um, and ways that we can help spur this in the future and, um, and, you know, by sponsoring students and so forth down the road. But it is, you know, I think that there is a, a wonderful attitude that the University of California has taken with respect to its IP because there's much more UC IP out there in the world than, you know, some of the stuff that, because that, Stanford has a great laundry list of things that they'll sell you that aren't going into products because they're too expensive. Um, and that's just not the case here. So. Um, so it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's an interesting question, and you know, I stand here in the Dotto Hall, I think, uh, uh, certainly a, uh, you know, he, he feels that, and I think all successful entrepreneurs feel that kind of gratitude to the UC system. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Following, following up on the gentleman's question, um, did you have to deal with an Office of Technology and Licensing here? I mean, most of them actually lose money the, in, in general at, at universities. And as you know, the tendency at Stanford, I've, I've worked at both Stanford and Berkeley, the tendency has been basically for people who've got a hot product to just disappear into a garage in Palo Alto as soon as they know that they've made a technological breakthrough and disavow any links with Stanford. Yeah, so, so I joined the company. I was not one of the founders. I joined the company about six months later. Um, but given that you know, Bob Broderson, who was still director of BWRC, was our chairman and, and remains very closely tied, and that I've kind of forced his students to also continue to have ties to the university. I believe that that was, you know, that that was done, but it, it predated me, so I can't speak directly to it. I'm, I'm Gary Kelson. I'm the director of the, uh, or actually the executive director of the Berkeley Wireless Research Center. So um, you know, Chin and Saurabh uh, were students when we started the center. 
But it's important to understand that we operate the center on a public domain research model. So all of their work was put in the public domain you know, for, for anyone to commercialize. Yep, yep. Now, they've, taken, they've advanced the technology substantially, I, I believe. And I think you mentioned that there's some IP, Cybeam IP, that's been developed around that. But that's kind of a, um, a, 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 an operating style here at Berkeley. And we believe that by putting our, the results of our technology in the public domain, companies like Cybeam will commercialize it more rapidly and that Berkeley gets a lot of um, credit for developing the enabling technology and furthers our research. More companies will support us. And we certainly hope you guys are tremendously successful. I'll give you my card so that you can, um, you can um, at the appropriate time, become a member of the center. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's, that's why I refer to as the, the incredibly, what I feel, generous policy that Berkeley has. But it's one that enables the, the technology to get out and actually do things. And, and I have to believe, not having been a researcher myself, but I have to believe that the whole motivation for you all to do this is to see it go in and, 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 and cause change in the world, right? Uh, so, so, you know, the fact that Sidebeam will be successful is a direct, or I hope certainly, will continue to be successful, um, you know, is the fact that everybody here should feel very good about making, you know, at least cables and TVs go away, which is not solving the world's ills, but certainly is satisfying from an intellectual standpoint to see this really turn into something. Um, and, uh, and like I said, I, I, I'm a UC graduate myself, although down in San Diego, and, and love the fact that uh, the policies are, are this way. So. All right, thank you, John. Right. More Thanks very much. Applause.